Thank you all. Thanks, Dr. Kelly, for the wonderful introduction and for the, the privilege and the opportunity to be here. Thanks, Dr. Farrington and others who've led us to uh, worship the Lord uh, today. A lot can happen in 21 years. I want to tell you that. I came to this campus in 1992, and a lot can happen in 21 years. I just want to tell you that and hope that you realize that. In one sense, that these are the greatest days of your life. I loved, loved, loved coming to chapel when I was a student here at uh, New Orleans Seminary. Uh, part of the reason I love coming to chapel because as a 21-year-old beginning preacher in a small church in Tickfaw, Louisiana, having to preach on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, coming to chapel was kind of sermon preparation to some degree. I was looking for anything and everything to share with those, uh, those, those folks. And it's uh, something of uh, uh, almost an emotional time to, to come back uh, today to preach. I loved uh, Brother Perry. I loved when he preached in, uh, in chapel. Didn't know him. Didn't know him at that time. And had no idea of how our paths would cross. Uh, but I loved when he would preach uh, in, in chapel. So I'm glad that you're here today. I know that there is a lot going on in your life uh, with uh, Thanksgiving upon us, with uh, final exams upon you and upon uh, final papers upon you and, and, and all the like. So I'm grateful that you are here uh, today. I'm going to take you today to a very, very familiar text of Scripture, John chapter 6. You'll find there in John chapter 6 the fourth miracle as uh, John gives it to us. Uh, fourth of seven miracles in the Gospel of, of John, and the most, uh, perhaps most well-known of all, say that because it's in all of the Gospels, of course, the, the feeding of the multitudes. I began this year, 2013, thinking about a subject that probably until, until then I had not really given a lot of thought about, and it's the whole subject of, of miracles. I was thinking about that because of a couple of needs that we had in, in our church as the year began, but, but also a very close personal relationship that I had with uh, someone that perhaps many of you know, and that's Dr. Rick Barjan, who uh, lost a very brief battle to, to cancer. I met Dr. Rick here on the campus of New Orleans Seminary in probably 1993 as I walked into his uh, unknown classroom of uh, introduction to the Old Testament. I'd heard about Dr. Wayland Bailey and I'd heard about Dr. Walter Brown, so I thought I'd give Dr. Barjan a try. I didn't know anything about, about him. No, not really. It's just sort of the way it worked out. And uh, about eight years ago, because of Katrina and because of his need to move to move somewhere other than New Orleans for, for a time, I had just become pastor at uh, First Baptist in Lafayette, and recommended Rick to go to my church that I was leaving in New Iberia, Louisiana. And because of that and some other circumstances in and around those things, we became very close, very fast friends and remain so until his passing this, this spring. But about this time last year, as a matter of fact, on the Tuesday following Thanksgiving Day, Rick called me with the devastating news that he had advanced stage of melanoma cancer. And he told me in that uh, conversation that unless God intervened, he was going to die. And he ended that conversation with these simple words, I need a miracle. And maybe not to that degree do you sit here this morning saying, I need a miracle. But perhaps there's a couple of you today, maybe, maybe even lots of you, that would say this morning, I need a miracle. And so I began really for the first time in my life looking at the, the subject of miracles. And I began here in John chapter 7 and with these uh, seven miracles with a very technical term in the Greek of, of a sign that uh, John used uh, along with the seven I am statements to help us to see something about Jesus. Uh, the seven I am sayings with the seven miracles used by John to help us to see that Jesus is 
who he says he is and who others are saying that he is and confirming that he is Messiah. Well, I must tell you that I'm a little anxious about this message today, not because um, I'm anxious in an uncertain way about preaching this message, but, but anxious in the sense that um, there's a lot of misunderstanding about, about miracles, right? And faith healers and television evangelists promising miracles when you send them your money have certainly not helped us in understanding miracles. And as such, our kind of Christianity, I think, has probably across the years kind of dismissed miracles. And instead of miracles that perhaps those are things that God once did, but for whatever reason, no longer continues to do. And I would say to us this morning, if that is so, then who said it's so? How do we know that's so? Before we get into our primary text, an account of a miracle today in John 6, we, we probably would do well to offer just sort of an introduction on the, on the whole subject of, of miracles. Maybe start with a definition of a miracle so that we're on the same page this morning of, of what it is exactly that we're talking about. And I discovered that many years ago, the famed Southern Baptist pastor and author, theologian, Herschel Hobbes gave this kind of definition to a miracle. He said, it's an act of God contrary to natural law as human beings understand it, but not contrary to natural law as God understands it, and which he performs in accord with his benevolent and redemptive purposes. Now, I love Dr. Hobbes. And far be it for me to stand against his definition. And it's not that I disagree with any, any part whatsoever of his definition. It's just that, well, it's just that I need something a little bit more simple than that. And so here's the way that I began back last January to think and to talk about miracles with a very simple definition that goes like this, that, that miracles are those things that can only be described by the phrase, God did it. Not the medicine, not a doctor, not someone's money, but can only be described by the phrase, God did it. There's no other explanation for it than God did it. And I certainly recognize that along with that definition of miracles that there's a danger of imbalance on either side when we talk about miracles. And I just want to kind of get those things out of the way this morning. I'm certainly not talking this morning about miracles on demand. I, I'm certainly not uh, thinking that uh, we need to leave here this morning thinking that whatever the perceived miracle need in my life is, that now that I've heard this message and, and now that I've given it to God, that this very thing is going to happen in my life. As a matter of fact, that could probably be the worst thing that happens should that happen to anyone who is here today. Remember, it's Jesus who said that an evil and adulterous generation seek after a sign. But... On the other side of the imbalance, we are also, also not talking about miracles as only happening back then and not now. And so I, what I want you to hear with me this morning as, as so goes the title of a book written by pastor, Southern Baptist pastor Adrian Rogers several years ago when he wrote the title, Believe in miracles, but trust in Jesus. I think that's what I want you to hear today. Believe in miracles, but trust in Jesus. So our text, John 6, verses 1 through 15. After this, Jesus crossed the Sea of Galilee, or Tiberias, and, and a huge crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was performing on the sick. So Jesus went up a mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now, now the Passover, a Jewish festival, was near. 
Therefore, when Jesus looked up and noticed a huge crowd coming toward him, he he asked Philip, where will we buy bread so these people can eat? He asked this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered, 200 denarii worth of bread wouldn't be enough for each of them to have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew Simon, Peter, uh, Peter's brother, uh, said, to, said to him, there, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Then Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, so they sat down. The men numbered about 5,000. And then Jesus took the loaves, and after giving thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also with the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were full, he told his disciples, collect the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they collected them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces from the five barley loaves that were left over by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign he had done, they said, this really is the prophet who was to come into the world. Therefore, when Jesus knew that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. The miracle of the 5,000, we call it. The miracle of the multitudes, we call it, because the text says to us that there were 5,000 men, not including uh, the others who uh, would have been there on, on that occasion. Certainly, this miracle is impressive from nothing. Well, nothing save the barley loaves and two fish that other gospels tell us that a lad produced. Except for that, from nothing, Jesus feeds the multitudes. Like all of the rest of the seven signs, like all of these miracles, certainly this miracle confirms who Jesus is. It clarifies for us and confirms that he is the Messiah and confirms what he is saying about himself and what others were saying about him. It reminds us that God can do all things. We have heard, you have heard many times, perhaps, that this is the one miracle that is in, in all four of the Gospels. And perhaps it's that alone as a place where we ought to start. Perhaps that alone tells us something of the importance of this miracle. If the other miracles say that nothing is too big for God, and this one confirms that, perhaps this miracle is saying to us that nothing is too small for God. That's what I want you students to hear today. There's nothing too big for God. But what I want you to hear with me today from this text is that there is neither nothing too small for God. Because that's what we need to hear sometimes, isn't it? That's what this miracle is saying. I want to call these little quick lessons that I want to share with you today lessons from a lunch. Lessons from a lunch, by the feeding of the 5,000 and others, Jesus is revealing several things to us. Number one, Jesus is saying to us, Jesus is revealing to us first that he cares. He cares. You know what I really like about this miracle? What I really like about this miracle is it's just lunch. It's just lunch lunch. It's not the royal official or nobleman's son who who is about to die. No one is about to die here in this story. They're not going to die if they don't eat. It's not the man by the pool for 38 years. They have been here just maybe a few hours through the course of just maybe one day. It's not the man's been by the pool for 38 years waiting to be healed. Nobody's blind. Nobody's lame. It's just lunch. But it's a reminder to us that he cares. They're not going to starve to death. Are they uncomfortable? Maybe. Are they sick? Possibly. But are they going to die? 
No. No. And so this miracle shows us that nobody has to be dying and, and nobody has to be permanently lame or blind or disfigured for God to care what's going on in our lives. And so what I want to ask you today is, does it make a difference to you? Does it make a difference to you that if it's important to you and it's not sin and it's not contrary to God's will, if it's important to you, it's also important to God. It's what I like about this miracle. You're not dying, but you need your house back in Georgia to sell. That house that you left before you came to this campus. You're not dying, but, but you need $1,000 to fix your car so that you could drive to North Mississippi next week to see your parents for Thanksgiving. You're not, you're not dying, but you're longing for God to provide you that soulmate for life whom you will marry and you will spend your life with doing ministry together. You're not, you're not dying, but you, you need those deacons, both of them and that church you're pastoring to, to come alongside of you and, and get it and get the work that is about the king's business you're not dying but but you sure do need to understand how to locate a greek or hebrew verb and in the next three weeks if possible right it's funny isn't it you, you didn't even know that verbs were missing until you came to seminary and now you're being asked to locate them it's just lunch but this miracle reminds us that if it's important to us, it's important to God. We will say sometimes that it's not about our, our happiness, it's about, about the holiness of God. And, and, and that is true. But let's not weave into that kind of thought that God doesn't care. You hear sometimes that it's all about the glory of God. And that is true. But let's not weave into that theology of it being all about the glory of God and forget that God is a gracious God and a good God and a compassionate God and he finds glory in being kind and being gracious and being compassionate upon us his children some might be saying well I listen to the needs of others and and his need is so much greater than mine. Her need is so much greater than, than mine. And, and we become almost ashamed to petition God for the things that we need in our life. I want to remind us today through this story that your need is great because it's your need. And we have a heavenly father that cares and is ready to meet that need. This miracle reminds us that he cares lessons from a lunch. But there's a second lesson here, and that is that he is conforming me. This miracle reminds us that God is conforming me to his way, to his will, to his purposes for, for my life. Verse 6 has to be to me the most important single verse of the application of this text he asked this that is jesus asked this this question where can we buy bread back in verse five he asked this to test him for he himself knew what he was going to do jesus asking the disciples about the feeding of the multitudes in order to test them. It's interesting, isn't it? Are the disciples needed for the miracle? No. We've seen this, though, in all the miracles, that though they are not needed or that humans are not needed, that God, God used them almost as props for the miracle. Jesus, the Messiah, the Master, the miracle worker, 
uses weak humans to produce the miracle. Might he be doing the same with us? What if, what if, what you are experiencing right now, that you would say that you are in a need of a miracle because of, what if those circumstances are necessary in your life to test you? Does that make a difference? Does it make a difference that, that what you're going through as a trial is to test you? It should, because know this, if God is the one giving the test, God is the one in control of the test. I, I learned this spiritual lesson in my academic career. Unfortunately and regrettably, I think I learned it, I think I learned it late though. When I was uh, working on my uh, PhD in New Testament in Greek, my major professor was uh, Dr. Gerald Stevens. I was hoping that he'd be here today, but he's probably at SBL now, now that I think about you saying that. Uh, as many of you know, Dr. Stevens is a, a godly and gracious man. Some of you didn't know that, that he was gracious yet, but you will one day. Godly and gracious man and very, as you know, very, very demanding in the classroom. And it almost appeared at times that he loved to give tests, give assignments. I remember being at SBL with Dr. Stevens. It was actually here in New Orleans in this particular year. And he strongly encouraged all of us New Testament PhD students to attend with him. The course of this convention, he invited me to go to lunch. What I thought was going to be a rather leisurely lunch. When I arrived, all the rest of the New Testament faculty at the time was also at the lunch, and it was just me. And, and instead of a leisurely lunch, they started peppering me with questions much like what I would later endure during my oral examination. And it was after it was all over with that I, I realized something. That was preparation. I didn't know it at the time. See, what I, what I learned was that my success as a student, what I saw as a test for me, was not just a test for me, but it was also a test for, get this, it was a test for my professors. For how much I learned was a gauge for how well they were doing. I didn't get that at the time, I gotta tell you. I thought they loved it, and they did. But you see, here's what I learned, and it's what I want you to see about God. When those professors give you a test, they don't give you a test to fail you. They give you the test to pass you. I didn't understand that when I was a student. They want you to pass. They want you to succeed. They want you to walk across this stage. But more importantly, they want you to be prepared for that future in ministry that God has for you. Now take that analogy and multiply that by infinity. And our gracious God, who desires the very best for us, is testing us. It's not so much a test, perhaps for us, as it is the test for God. That sounds strange, doesn't it? But he is conforming us to his will. But he sends them the look. 
Why does he do that? I think a couple of things. Because the third thing is this. What's the first? He cares for us. He is conforming us. But thirdly, he is confirming who he is. Does it make a difference to you that God himself knows what he is going to do? That's what the text says. He sent them looking, but he himself knew already what he was going to do. God has a plan. There are no emergencies in heaven. There there is no panic button in heaven. Just because Jesus sent the disciples to look, according to verse 6, certainly does not mean that he didn't have a plan. But two things, two significant things happened when the disciples were made to go look. First thing that happened was this. They realized that they had more than they thought they had. They didn't think they had anything. But they realized in their luck that they had more than they thought. They had two fish and five barley loaves. Maybe some of you today think that you're about at the end of your rope but I would encourage you to go look you might have more than you think you have and the second thing that was discovered is that what they had was still woefully short and so there was the need to depend upon Jesus and because of that All there that day knew that Jesus performed this miracle. And here is yet another example of what total dependence upon Jesus means. So many have said across the years, you you, you don't know that Jesus is all, all you need until he's all you've got. Sometimes we have to be placed into those kinds of situations. My, my, favorite, my favorite band is the band Third Day. Their most recent single is a uh, simple song that simply says, I need a miracle. Maybe that's some of you today. The background to that song comes from a concert of theirs where A woman met them after the concert and told them the story about her young adult son who had come to the end of himself, had come to the end of uh, uh, of what he believed to be his life and decided that he was going to drive out into the woods alone and take his own life. Upon arriving at that spot that he had chosen, He flipped on the radio, thinking that he would listen to one song, and then he was prepared to end end his life. The miracle of their story is that a song by Third Day happened to be playing on, on the radio. The song that says, cry out to Jesus. The song that says, and to all the people with burdens and pains, keeping you back from your life. You believe that there's nothing and there is no one who can make it right. For the marriage that's struggling just to hang on, they've lost all faith in love. They've done all they can do to make it right again. It's still not enough. For the ones you you can't break the addictions and chains, you you try to, to give them up, but they come back again. Just remember, you're not alone in your shame and your suffering when you're lonely and it feels like the whole world is falling in on you you just reach out you just cry out they sing to Jesus for there is help for the hopeless and rest for the weary and love for the broken heart there is grace and forgiveness and mercy and healing he'll he'll meet you wherever you are and cry out to Jesus 
cry out to Jesus. That mother told the band that song, and in that story, they, they wrote another song, I Need a Miracle. And in that song, they say what I want all of us to hear again today. They sing in that song, does it matter who you are or what you've done? There will come a time when you can't make it on your own. That's what we need to hear today. Would you bow your heads with me? I, I suspect, because I've been where you are, I suspect that there's one or two who would say today, I need God to do something that can only be explained by God by God doing it. I want to just close our time by you giving me the privilege to pray on your behalf. I want to use as our prayer a prayer from the Bible, Ephesians chapter 1. Think about that need. If you sent something today, before I pray, would you just simply slip up your hand? I need, I need something to happen that can only be explained by God doing it. Thank you. And so, O oh Lord, on behalf of these, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, would give them a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of their heart may be enlightened so that each one may know what is the hope of your calling, what are the glorious riches of all of your inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of your power to those of us who believe according to the working of your vast strength. O oh Lord, today, hear our prayer. Thank you for providing just lunch when it's lunch that we need. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Just wait.